Hello and welcome to Gabbit Media. I'm Grant Abbott and today we're looking at part 5 of Node School. In this episode we'll be looking closely at PBRs and how to set them up, along with a bit of theory about what they are. So do make sure you've checked out the previous versions, if you are a complete beginner to Nodes. If you're just looking to understand PBR materials, then you should be fine diving straight into this one. Now I'm not going to go fully into detail about what a PBR is, because I think there's a lot of information on the internet about that. Andrew Price, or Blender Guru as you might know him, did an excellent video about what PBRs are, so I'll put a link to that video in the description. There'll also be links to several other things in the description, so do check that out. So to explain PBR, I will set up our scene. I'll delete the default cube and add in a sphere instead, because I think it looks a bit better. I'll press Control 2 that adds a subdivision surface with two iterations, and I'll right click and shade smooth. I'll press G then Z1 to move it above the surface. Okay, let's go into the shading area. I'll move this up slightly so we can see our nodes a bit more and zoom in to our sphere. Let's create a new material. So in Blender 2.8, we have the principled BSDF node into the material output as our default material. And the principled BSDF node makes our material a PBR material. So if you aren't aware, PBR stands for physically based rendering, which basically means they're trying to be realistic with the materials so that they react to light and the environment just like a real object would. Now when people talk about PBRs, you often see packs like this, which have the color information, the displacement, the normals, the ambient occlusion, and the roughness. Some also have a metallic map. If you want lots of free PBR textures, then look at the links in the description. I've put several in there. So those material maps are simply textures that you plug into the base color, the metallic if there is one, the roughness, and the normals. Don't worry too much about ambient occlusion and displacement. I'll talk about those in later videos. So those are the main controllers for PBR, but we don't have to have textures that come into this principled shader to make it a PBR. This principled shader is in fact a PBR material. So if I go to the World tab now, and I place an HDRI in here, Shift A, Texture, Environment Texture, and I'll open up an HDRI. I'll plug that in, and I'll go to the Render tab. So if I go back to my object and change the roughness, we can see it reflecting the environment around it in a realistic way as any real object would. If I were to change the environment, we can see that our sphere changes slightly with it. So the reflections and the way the light is interacting with the object. So this in itself is a PBR material. So we don't have to have images plugged into it in order for it to be one. This is set up in a way that will mimic the real world. So as a quick test, try and make a realistic gold material. Okay, so that's fairly straightforward. We make a sort of goldy color, perhaps a bit more dark, and then we change the metallic up, and the roughness, depending on how shiny you want it, we bring that down. So yes, this is a PBR material, and this will react to the environment lighting around it. So if we want to use PBR packs, such as these, and you can follow along with this bit, you need any PBR that you get from one of the sites mentioned in the description, or you can use the one that I've used, and again, I'll put that link in the description. We need to bring these textures in and plug them to the relevant slots. So I'll bring in the color, the roughness, and the normals, and for now, I'll leave the ambient occlusion and the displacement. In order to plug these in, the color's fairly straightforward. We plug that straight into the color, and we can see it changed there. I'll bring the metallic down, Here's the roughness, and that can go straight into the roughness there, but it is helpful to change it from sRGB to non-color data. And that's because it's not actually using color, it's using black and white information. And we can see the slight difference that's made. The last one we need to put in is the normal map. Now the normal map is this strange looking map here, and much like bump maps, which we've used before, where the black and white information is height information, well the color information in this is height information as well as the direction of light information. So it's a little bit smarter than a bump map. So let's go back to Blender and plug that in. But we can't go straight from the color to the normal. That's a yellow into a blue and it doesn't work. So we have to Shift A, add a vector normal map, not a bump map, but a normal map this time. We'll bring that in there. We'll plug the color into the color so yellow into yellow and the blue into the blue. At the moment it is working, but there are some anomalies. And that's because its color space is set to sRGB. It's very important that with the normal map, you change this to non-color data. And can you see the slight change there? 
and now our interesting crystal material now looks very bumpy. Now our texture is stretched at the top here, so have a think how we can sort this out so it's got a box projection instead. So I'll give you a moment to have a go at that. So at the moment it's using a UV setup, and if I go into edit mode and go across to UV editing, we can see our UVs there. And we can see all those top triangles, and that's those ones here. And if I put this onto rendered mode, you can see there's all lots of stretching where they meet together there. So we're going to need some box projection. So if we go back to the shading tab, so let's zoom in on the first one. And if I press Control T with the Node Wrangler installed, make sure you go to Edit, Preferences, Add-ons, type in Node Wrangler and make sure it's ticked. So I press Control T and we get the texture coordinates. Now we don't want to go from the UV map. It's better to go from either the object or generated. Object is preferable in most cases. And sometimes it doesn't work, particularly if you've got maps that aren't completely square. So I come into here and I change this to box. Now we need to change this for every single one, otherwise we're going to get the stretching in the normal map and roughness, but not in the color. The easy way to do that is to bring this across here and just hook this up to each of the vectors. I can actually press Alt right click and hook that up like this. It makes it easier than trying to find the vector. Then I'll change each of these to box. And it's looking a bit better, but we can see that obvious seam there. So have a think, how do we change that? Well, hopefully you remembered that you put up the blend, but try and put it up so the blend is the same on each. So this is 0.1 almost. So I'll type in 0.1 on each of these. And you can just about see where it blends, but it's not too bad. Now it's mapped those quite small, so I could change the scale here. So I can select them all by sort of box selecting or dragging over all of them, and maybe change it to something like 0.5. And that's doing quite an effective job. Yes, we can see a bit of blurring around here on the seams. We could even try and turn it down and change the blend, but I'll leave you to play with that and try that out. So your challenge now is to set up a few spheres with PBR materials from some PBR packs which you've downloaded. Remember there's links in the description to several different sites for those. And if you know of any more, then please put them in the comments below. In the next episode, we'll be looking at displacement maps and ambient occlusion maps. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.